Hello, Sally and I welcome you to Streams of Living Water, flowing today from Ramona Avenue Christian Church in Laverne. We in the Kingdom of God, the Body of Christ, the Church, are called to live as slaves, or in a more palatable phrase, as servants, one of another, because we are servants of God. Why? Do we get points? Does God hear our prayers better? Today, we're going to find out. I'm Pastor David Burkadall. My wife, Reverend Sally Welch, and I are co-producing these videos, Streams of Living Water, to share a sense of connection and encouragement and an opportunity to reflect on what it means to be a Christian in this global pandemic and as we emerge into the new normal. We are retired clergy with over 80 years of ordained ministry experience between us. I heard a story about being a VIP. The Pope was invited to come and speak before the General Assembly at the United Nations building in New York. The morning of his speech, he and his entourage left his hotel, came out onto the street, and a member of his staff came running toward him and said, the, the Pope Mobile, it, it has a flat tire. And the Pope said, don't worry, I'll meet you there. And he hailed a cab, jumped in, and said, United Nations building. The, driver was flabbergasted, <laughs> turned around and said, Your Holiness, Your Holiness, this is my first day in the job and I don't know how to get there. The Pope said, Don't worry, my son. I know the way. Slide over. I'll drive. So the Pope was now late and he's flying through the streets of Manhattan, dodging cars, cutting through yellow lights. All of a sudden he looks in his rearview mirror because he sees the flashing red and green lights behind him and pulls over. Police officer comes to the cab, looks into the driver's seat, and walks back to his car to call his precinct office. Sarge, he says, I've got a situation. Well, what is it, the sergeant says. I've just pulled over a VIP. What should I do? The sergeant said, well, is it an alderman? He said, no, no, way more important than that. I said, well, well, is it the mayor? He said, more important than that. He said, well, is it at the governor? He said, look, I don't know who he is, but he's got the Pope for a driver. Two of Jesus' disciples wanted to be VIPs. They had followed Jesus and they felt that they deserved to ask for a reward in return. They had asked Jesus in Mark 10, verse 37b, grant us to sit one at your right hand and one at your left in your glory. They wanted to be in the picture, the ones who everybody saw when they looked at Jesus. They wanted to be near power in positions of power, to be in the entourage, and they thought of it first. In Mark 10, 41, we get the other disciples' response. When the 10 heard this, they began to be angry with James and John. Why were they angry with them? Were they angry because so little of Jesus' teaching had sunk in with their fellow disciples? Or were they angry with themselves because they hadn't asked first? Given Jesus' response, I think the latter. Jesus called all the disciples together to hear his answer resuming in Mark 10, 42. So Jesus called them and said to them, you know that among the Gentiles, those whom they recognize as their rulers lord it over them, and their great ones are tyrants over them. Jesus put their behavior in the context of those around them, the Gentiles, the non-Jews of the world surrounding them, were the Romans and those whose lives had been greatly changed by the coming of the Roman Empire. The Roman Empire was highly hierarchical, all the way up to the emperor. It started in the military. You couldn't get a highly sought after civil service job unless you had first served in the military. The primary ways the Jews interfaced with the empire was through the military and the civil service. And Jesus knew how people behaved in a hierarchy. He said to his disciples, you know that among the Gentiles, those whom they recognize as their rulers lorded over them and their great ones are tyrants over them. Among the Gentiles, he said, position was power. It's different than the kingdom of God, Jesus said. Jesus continues in Mark 10 with verse 43. But it is not so among you. But whoever wishes to become great among you must be your servant. 
and whoever wishes to be first among you must be slave of all. This is not your typical motivational speech. You don't see those words appear on a poster in anyone's cubicle. Hmm? Whoever wishes to be great among you must be your servant. Who aspires to be a servant or a slave? In a household, their jobs were the lowest. Ted Sample, in his book, Hard Living People and Mainstream Christians, I think, says that some hard living people will say things like, I don't take nothing from nobody. But if you look at their lives, they are at the bottom of the food chain. They have to take everything from everybody and their lives are filled with anger and frustration. Who do you recognize as the rulers of your life? Do they lord it over you or do they serve you? Which would you rather have? Martha was stressed taking care of and feeding Jesus and his disciples. Mary sat with the disciples listening to what Jesus taught. I remember a serendipity Bible study that I taught once that asked, who would you rather work for, a Mary or a Martha? And then it asked, who would you rather have working for you, a Mary or a Martha? Things look different depending on where you are in a hierarchy, being lorded over or being the one doing the lording over. I think that addressing this issue can be one of the key contributions that the church makes to our culture as we move out of this pandemic and into the new normal. Are we to be lords and tyrants or servants and slaves? What we model to the world and the way we treat one another can make all the difference in getting through this pandemic and overcoming our current cultural divides. Cosmos, one of our local restaurants, has a sign in its drive through window that says something like, we apologize if you had to wait. We are short-staffed. Please be patient with those who did show up to work today. No one wants to work anymore. We are experiencing a labor shortage in many industries. Is it because we are still at risk of receiving and spreading the virus? Is it because there are still many who don't care about others? Is it because people can get by with food pantries and stimulus checks? Or is it because they got used to doing whatever they wanted while in isolation from others? Probably all of those, but I would add one more. Maybe another factor is that some people got used to setting their own agenda and just don't want to deal with the workplace pressures, the workplace drama, the politics, and being supervised by people who lorded it over them. A book was published in the late 1960s called The Peter Principle. The author, Lawrence J. Peter, observed that in any hierarchical organization, people rise to the level of their incompetence. That is, if you do well at your job, you get promoted. If you do well at that job, you get promoted. If you do well at that job, you get promoted, and so on up through the hierarchy until you don't do well, then you don't get promoted. So in any mature hierarchical organization, everyone is working at their level of incompetence. That explains a lot, doesn't it? What would we have to do to keep that from happening? Well, imagine what would happen if everyone in a hierarchical organization wasn't looking for an opportunity to move up, but for a chance to better serve. What if everyone rose to the level of their greatest contribution and had the humility to recognize their true limitations. I'm not talking about promoting poor self-esteem or lack of ambition, but redefining it from what serves me best to what serves God. From seeking power over others to being the servant and slave of others because we first serve God. Bob Dylan said it in his song, You Gotta Serve Somebody. The first verse and chorus goes like this. You may be an ambassador to England or France. You may like to gamble. You may like to dance. You may be the heavyweight champion of the world. You may be a socialite with a long string of pearls. But you're going to have to serve somebody. Yes, indeed, you're going to have to serve somebody. Well, it may be the devil or it may be the Lord. But you're going to have to serve somebody. That's one of life's basic questions, isn't it? Who do you serve? We all serve somebody. Is life only about serving ourselves? Or is there something more? 
We, in the kingdom of God, in the church, the body of Christ, are called to live as slaves, or in a more palatable phrase, as servants of one another, because we are servants of God. Why? Do we get points? Does God hear our prayers better? We get the answer in the last verse of this passage in Mark 10, verse 45. For the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. We live in response to what God has already done for us on the cross. We can't earn it. We were captive to sin, but Jesus paid the ransom for us with his blood. We live as a new creation, as people who are different, born again, in a living relationship with the one true living God. That relationship expresses itself in service to one another naturally and organically in the body of Christ. Paul writes to the church at Galatia in Galatians 5, 13 through 14, For you are called to freedom, brothers and sisters, only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for self-indulgence, but through love become slaves to one another. For the whole law is summed up in a single commandment. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Why? And how does this happen? As John writes in 1 John 4, 19, we love because he first loved us. We are servants in response to God's love for us shown on the cross. For the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Let us pray. We thank you, Lord, that you have called us into a living relationship with you, that you have given it to us as a gift, that you ask only that we open our hearts and receive it. We pray that each day we might live with fully open hearts to you, that the leading of your Holy Spirit may bring us to a love toward you that expresses our love for each other in acts of service and kindness and support, that we may live together in the Christian community, the abundant life that is your will for all people. We pray for Dean George Pandua and our brothers and sisters in Christ in Tanzania, particularly in the new church at Takawa. For pastors and church leaders as they make difficult decisions about worship and community life for the greater good of God's people as we move into the new normal. For lasting peace in the Middle East, particularly in Afghanistan, and for our armed forces who have served there. For recovery for Haiti and for an end to the pandemic throughout the world as well as an end to the tragedies at our borders, and that all may come to peace and life and salvation in you. For healing for Jeffrey and Jeff and David and Kurt and Stephen, and for Heather and Sean's ministry. For comfort and peace in the sure and certain hope of resurrection unto eternal life for the families of all those who have died of COVID-19 and other causes over the past year and a half. We ask these things in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Today, let's remember to pray for all those who have yet to get the vaccine. They are most at risk of getting the virus or one of the variants and of passing it on to others. And let's remember to pray the Lord's Prayer today, the one that Jesus taught us. If you don't know what that is, contact us at the Revs David and Sally at gmail.com or send us a tweet to at David Burkadal and we'll send it to you. Send your comments there as well. Finally, we encourage you to stay hydrated, to allow the streams of living water to shape and form you, to open your heart and mind to the presence and will of God at work in your lives right now. If you're a member of a church, support your pastor and church leaders. If you're not a member, talk to a relative or a friend, someone who knows you well and can give you some guidance, someone you trust. Pray about it. Ask the Holy Spirit to guide you toward the place where you can best serve and use your gifts for the building up of the whole body of Christ. Remember to wear your masks, wash your hands, maintain social distancing as much as possible. We still need to do those things, but most importantly, get your vaccine. Do it for others, if not for yourself. It's the one thing we can do that will most literally save lives and bring us back into the life that, that is coming, into the new normal. If you're having struggles with mental health issues or thoughts of suicide, contact someone, talk to someone you know, a friend or relative, a professional. Contact the hotline. There are people all around you who will walk with you through this dark time into the life that is to come. 
finally remember to be kind to everybody you come into contact with. We all struggle in some ways during this pandemic, even as we're moving out of it. Be a person that builds up and encourages others and prepares us all to move into the new normal with all the gifts and life that God has given us. And now let us receive the blessing of God. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.